think we're going to get started. I want to welcome everybody to tonight's Mansfield Lecture. I'm Jane Karras, president of the college, and it's always great to see our community here supporting us. Without you, we wouldn't have this great college. And I know many of you know about our project to build a new building, a new student center. If you haven't been to our new library, stop in and see it. It's open to the public. We have a coffee bar in there, great places to sit and read or visit. And our new college center will have a gym for our students and the community, as well as a 1,000-seat performance hall for lectures and concerts. And the, it will be the home of the Glacier Symphony and Chorale. So we hope you all can join us. And there's always an opportunity to help support that project. It's definitely a community project. So this is FECC's annual Mike Mansfield Lecture Series. This is our third lecture. And it celebrates the achievements and legacy of one of our finest political leaders, our fellow Montanan, Michael Joseph Mansfield, who served as a U.S. representative from 1943 to 1953 and as a U.S. senator from 1953 to 1977. He served Montana and the nation during his many years on Capitol Hill and as U.S. ambassador to Japan from 1977 to 1989. Mike was known for his vibrant spirit of inclusivity, thoughtful political finesse, sterling integrity, humble personality, exemplary statesmanship and cordial collaboration across political aisles and divides. With this lecture series made possible by a generous gift to FECC's foundation, we honor Mansfield's lifetime achievements, diplomacy, legendary spirit of inclusivity, and his leadership. Tonight's presenter is another Montanan whose work incorporates and upholds values that Mike embraced. Dr. Karen Ruth Adams joins us from the University of Montana Department of Political Science where she currently teaches various courses in international relations and security, as well as international law. Dr. Adams has published extensively on great power politics, the effects of military technology, as well as the conduct and consequences of war. After earning a bachelor's degree from Stanford University, Dr. Adams received a master's and doctoral degree in political science from the University of California, Berkeley. Due to her geopolitical forecasting, Dr. Adams was named a super forecaster in 2014 and has since briefed members of the U.S. defense and intelligence community on topics pertaining to international relations and security forecasting. In her lecture entitled First Among Equals, the U.S., China, and 21st Century Leadership, Dr. Adams explores the relevance of Mansfield's leadership philosophy in the context of contemporary global politics and security particularly as these pertain to the United States-China relations. Just want to remind you, if you didn't get a card, there'll be some passed around later. If you have any questions for Dr. Adams, you can write your question on a card and we'll collect them and then she'll be able to answer some of the questions at the end of her lecture. So please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Adams. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. I want to thank President Karras for that warm invitation and introduction. I also want to acknowledge Gerda Reeb, who has been so helpful in making, helping me think about the talk and um, inviting me back for a second time to FVCC in the recent years. This lecture is uh, sponsored by Mr. and Mrs. Peter Tracy, who I also want to acknowledge. It's unusual to meet a donor in the community who is so committed to the idea of um, uh, extending the legacy of a great statesman like uh, Mike Mansfield in both a public lecture format like that, this that Mike would really have enjoyed. Uh, he'd love to hear from all sorts of different kinds of people. And also um, sponsoring scholarships for social studies students, so thank you. Um, I'm honored to be the third speaker here for the Mansfield Lecture. As you may remember, uh, Governor Roscoe was here a couple years ago, the Republican former governor of Montana, and Ambassador Baucus was here last year. I think Mike Mansfield would have been very pleased to have both scholars and statesmen uh, addressing your series. He taught history and political science for several years at the University of Montana before he became a U.S. congressman and senator. And so uh, in Mike, we really see the best of, um, well, I suppose you might even say a philosopher king, although I doubt very much <laughs> that he would have been willing to take that honorific. My talk tonight is called First Among Equals, the U.S., China, and the 
20 of 21st century leadership. And I got this idea for the title when I was reading a speech that uh, Mansfield gave in 1988 at the age of 95. It was the first leader's lecture in the US Senate. He was invited by then um, uh, Majority Leader Republican Trent Lott. Uh, he was ostensibly invited because Mansfield had been very important in um, the raising the funds and the energy behind the remodel of this very old room. Um, but of course, um, Mike was also a real institution himself, and um, uh, 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 Senator Lott recognized that in his introduction for Mike Mansfield. So you see him here giving the lecture. And uh, in the lecture, he does several things. But the things that I thought were most interesting, I've quoted here. He First, he talks about how the Senate majority and minority leaders are first among equals. In other words, that it's important for the Senate majority and minority leader not to get too full of themselves and think that you know, the majority leader can really boss the minority leader around. So that's the first part. Um, and also that they are equals, and they are among equals. In other words, the, all the folks who are not the leaders of the Senate need to have their uh, views be respected. In fact, there's one point in the speech where Mansfield says, I'm sure if you asked every member of the Senate who is the most important senator here today, he would say, it's me. And um, actually, that was something that Mansfield really celebrated, was the idea that every person has a responsibility to stand up and speak for themselves and to uh, represent themselves to the fullest extent that they can. So it wasn't a problem. It was something for leaders to remember and to celebrate. The other thing that he did in this um, first leader's lecture in 1998 was he quoted the ancient Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, who said, a leader is best when people hardly know he exists. And of that leader, the people will say when his work is done, we did this ourselves. Today, I was in Dr. Marty Mullen's Introduction to American Government class, and we talked about civil liberties. And I was really struck with the way that she talked about civil liberties and the role that they play uh, in restraining the government's actions with regard to individuals and the important role of balancing individual rights and community rights. And um, I think although the Chinese system is obviously very different from, from the American system and Lao Tzu had never heard of America when he said such things that were written down many thousands of years ago, um, still there is a, um, an interesting um, resonance in, in our thinking today about politics that, that we do have in common with China and other much older and quite different civilizations. And I think that Mike was really highlighting that here, that it is important to leave room for people to be able to help themselves, and to have a sense that they have some free will and some autonomy in their lives. So these, um, I have found, are not unusual things for Mike Mansfield to have talked about in the speeches that he gave or in the policies that he wrote and in the actions that he undertook in his many years as a uh, leader uh, for the United States. And so I, I would characterize these things uh, in terms of uh, realism. Uh, he often talked about being realistic and he, he, as a former scholar, he actually talked about realism as a, as a theory. There's a famous international relations theory known as realism. And um, his ideas that I just discussed in terms of this speech and that I've noticed in other work that he's carried out basically can be divided into these different categories, these three main principles of his realism. The first one is that some actors will always have more power or capabilities than other actors. So in this speech, he talks about, you know, in the Senate, there's the majority leader, there's the minority leader. Um, the majority leader is more powerful than the minority leader, but, and they're both more powerful than everybody else. Um, in international relations, you can think about great powers. Uh, I read a speech, or rather a, a summary of a meeting that he had in China in 1974, and he and a Chinese leader were talking about uh, whether China was a superpower. And um, the Chinese leader 
said no, he did not think that China was yet a superpower in 1974. And um, maybe when China was up to making 100 million tons of steel a year, then we could think of China as a superpower. Incidentally, I looked, and they, they made it to there by the end of the 1990s. Uh, in his, in his um, debriefing that he sent to President Ford after this meeting, he said, well, of course, the Chinese president was correct, or the Chinese minister was correct that China is not yet a great power, he said at that time. Um, there really are differences among states, and at that time it was just the U.S. and Soviet Union that were great powers. But he predicted that within 20 to 30 years, China would be a great power. So Mike Mansfield was very attuned to the distribution of power in the international system. Also, he was attuned to the distribution of power within states, and um, that's, I think, why he was so um, interested in this comment by Lao Tzu and other comments that he makes over the years about the importance of paying attention to what the people need and what they want. It's important for, the gov for us to recognize that the government has more power than the people and therefore can inadvertently harm the people and needs to take the people's wishes into consideration. So this leads us into the second principle of Mike Mansfield's realism, which is that the power of the powerful depends on others. Now you can see that domestically, you know, government doesn't stand for very long, especially a democratic government, if voters aren't going to keep voting for the uh, people who are running for office. You can also see it in authoritarian states though. Um, we know in China and the Soviet Union and Russia and other more authoritarian states that leaders spend a lot of time thinking about what the people want because they too need to um, avoid a revolution. In some respects, it's much harder in authoritarian states to figure out um, you know, how to maintain your power. Then in international relations, of course, our power depends on others as well. Not so much in a legal and uh, legitimacy sort of way, but it's very easy in international relations for states to deliberately or inadvertently do things that hurt one another. And when they do so, they can expect resistance from other states, and that resistance can be very damaging. So international relations are very risky if you um, th don't remember that you're in a community, essentially, and that mutual security is, is an important principle. Finally, Mansfield uh, constantly reiterates uncertainty. He, um, for example, talks about how there are many possible threats um, and that power is not the same as control. Even for a very powerful state, you can't always get what you want. Now, these uh, principles of Mansfield's realism have some really important policy implications that we'll come back to at the end of the lecture after we've talked about China's rise as a great power. Um, but I've just, I'll just mention them here. So first of all, given that there are p more and less powerful actors in the world, it's important to pay attention to the distribution of power. And Mansfield is constantly talking about how U.S. policymakers are living in the last century or the last decade. They need to update their assessments in order to understand, for example, the contemporary role of, of China or the situation uh, with India or with Russia. Um, so it's important to look at the distribution of power and it's important to recognize that it can change. Also it's important, given the fact that there is no world government, to figure out, the states need to figure out how to help themselves to survive and to prosper uh, both internationally and domestically uh, because they can't really help count on anybody else to do that in any kind of reliable way. The policy implications of, um, of this idea of mutual security um, are not too surprising. You need to think about the effects of your actions on others so that they don't blow back and harm you. Uh, you need to respect all actors, whether or not they are currently the most powerful because you don't know what, they, what their capabilities might be later. Or even, um, even if you don't think they're going to be capable later, um, they could be important to you. And frankly, from Mansfield's point of view, all people's ideas, are important, All their survival is important. We see again and again he talks about the uh, universality of human aspirations and, um, and the similarities of people across the world so that um, you know, the ethical thing to do is to think about 
uh, how our actions will affect others and how, like us, they will probably want some autonomy. So we should not be offended if they want to help themselves or they want to be self-reliant in some, some ways. Finally, the policy implications of, un of uncertainty are that you don't want to only focus on one issue or one threat. So even at the height of the Cold War, Mansfield, uh, in the late 1950s, he was talking about how, yeah, Russia is the big power that the United States should be thinking about, but there's a lot of other threats out there as well. So we don't want to get too myopic and only focus on Russia. So it's a constant uh, process of, of risk assessment, balancing, um, and considering various threats and so on. Also, he was no idealist. He did not believe that there was going to be one perfect policy that was going to completely solve a problem today or forever. It was always a process of essentially calibrating the policy to the situation, then updating it. It was a never-ending story of adaptation. And so he articulated what we would consider to be timeless principles like prudence and caution and restraint, self-restraint. Um, but he uh, was never really categorical about any particular policy that he thought the U.S. should always adopt or always resist. Now, when we think about Mansfield's leadership, uh, he, he was in politics for a long time. So I just want to you know, make sure it's clear that he didn't just talk about China, even though that's going to be my focus tonight. Um, I, I, wanna, I want you to have a bigger picture of what Mansfield's contribution was uh, to American politics and Montana politics as well as international relations. And this multifaceted leadership really reflects the principles that we've talked about already. Uh, he, he was really attuned to people all through his career, to Montana citizens whom he represented. And at the same time, he was a very noted internationalist during um, the World War II and the Cold War. And so he operated on many stages and many theaters around the world. So he started out uh, as an underage uh, army um, infantryman in World War I. He joined up um, not admitting his age. Uh, when it was discovered, he got in trouble. And at the, in the 1920s, he joined the Marines. And his first trip to Asia was with the Marines. He remembered sailing along and going into some ports in, um, in China around Shanghai. In the 1930s, after he met uh, Maureen Mansfield, uh, who uh, was uh, very important in his life, um, helping him to finish his undergraduate degree, actually also getting a high school degree, which he did not have at that point. Um, she gave up her life insurance policy to pay his tuition so that he could go to school at the University of Montana. He always acknowledged her role in his life. Um, and I think you can see it wasn't necessarily just from the point of view of, you know, the instrumental relationship of their life, but he really saw that, you know, people doing things like that for one another was a form of leadership. And so, for example, in, at the University of Montana, we don't just have the Mike Mansfield Institute, we have the Mike and Maureen Mansfield Institute, and that was always at his insistence. So he taught uh, history and political science at the University of Montana uh, for quite a while, as you can see. Um, then he ran for Congress after World War um, II was over, and in the 1950s, he gave a series of speeches, first as a congressman, uh, uh, and then in, in the House, and then later in the Senate, a series of speeches on U.S. foreign policy. We'll talk about one he gave later on um, U.S. On US Soviet relations. From the late 1960s to the 1970s, he, he was the... Um, Senate Majority Leader for a longer period than that, but that's really the period in which he's most noted for his international accomplishments. And in that period, he began to speak up critically of the U.S. war in Vietnam. He was the first policymaker in the U.S. to go on the record against the war in Vietnam. He did that after he had been to Vietnam and uh, seen the casualties and the difficulties that both the U.S. and the South Vietnamese government were having there. Um, the Nixon Doctrine was an important um, development that uh, President Nixon, a Republican, articulated at that uh, in the late, uh, in the 
late 1960s, 19, early 1970s, um, it turns out that that Nixon, when he was elected president in the late 1960s, he decided that he would meet regularly with Mike Mansfield. And so they met once a month on their own, and their, they met other times as well, but they had this monthly meeting, and the purpose of the meeting was for Mansfield to talk about China with Nixon. And Mansfield's anti-war uh, sentiment and his, um, his sense that China was becoming so much more significant, we should not continue to recognize Taiwan instead of the People's Republic of China. At that time, we were basically ignoring the fact that the China existed in our diplomatic relations. Um, he was very important in helping Nixon to formulate this change in his policy. And that was in spite of the fact that Nixon was a Republican and Mansfield was a Democrat. So ultimately then, um, uh, this change uh, went through initially with Nixon, then F uh, President Ford, a Republican, and finally President Carter, a Democrat, um, worked on the normalization of relations with China. So in 19, uh, 1979, um, the, pr the president of China came to the United States and the U.S. recognized China and um, unrecognized Taiwan. Uh, from 1977 to 1988, Mansfield served uh, first as Carter's and then as Reagan's ambassador to Japan. And again, it's very unusual for an ambassador to you know, serve uh, multiple uh, party presidents, and yet it was very important to Reagan that, uh, that he stay on. Am ambassador Mansfield actually gave Reagan his, his resignation, and Reagan called him supposedly in the middle of the night as he was packing and said, I really want you to stay. So Mansfield says he woke up Maureen. She said, okay, and they decided they would stay. So he's very well known internationally, but of course, as Senate Majority Leader for 16 years, the longest of any majority leader still to this day, uh, one would have a big influence on domestic issues. And some of the domestic issues of the day were civil rights, the Great Society Program, with um, you know, uh, different forms of, uh, of income support, educational support, and so on for ordinary Americans. Um, at, in 1970, a Republican president, Richard Nixon, proposed the Environmental Protection Agency, and this was something that um, uh, Mike Mansfield supported. And of course, later, uh, when, when Watergate occurred and um, uh, the Congress was censoring President Nixon for the actions that he took in his reelection during, uh, during this time, um, Mansfield was important in um, leading the Senate and the House in, through the Watergate scandal. One of the big uh, results of the Vietnam War in the Congress was that the Congress passed something called the War Powers Act, which said that, con that presidents can only um, authorize troops to go into conflict situations for short periods of time in an emergency, and after that emergency, it, and they have to alert Congress when they're doing this, and then after a period, they will either have to withdraw them or the Congress must support the action. If, of course, if there had been uh, a rule like that during the Vietnam War and it had been respected, then the Vietnam War would not have escalated so far before Congress uh, became involved. In some really interesting interviews that you can read, you can read the transcripts and you can also hear the oral um, discussion, um, Mansfield gave these interviews to his biographer in the 1990s. Uh, the biographer asked him, what are you most proud of doing in your whole time as senator? And Mansfield said, oh, nobody else would think these were important, but to me, these were the most important things of my career. And they were these two Montana issues. First, saving Flathead Lake, he said that the Army Corps of Engineers had you know, wanted to disregard what it would take to keep the lake you know, a thriving ecosystem in an effort to tap it for power. And so he worked on some sort of compromise to save Flathead Lake. And then also building a VA center in Miles City, Montana, 
because um, veterans from eastern Montana, South Dakota, and northern Wyoming were having to go to southern Wyoming in order to um, receive the help that they needed. And of course, he was very concerned with veterans. Montana has always been a state that has a lot of military participation. And as I mentioned, he saw the effects of US, the US war in Vietnam on American um, soldiers right up close. Okay, well you can see that Mansfield did a lot in his career. Um, and it's not surprising then that in 1999, the Missoulian did this ranking of the most influential Montanans in the 20th century, and Mike Mansfield was voted, or was deemed, I don't know if there was a vote, he was deemed to be the number one most influential Montanan in the 20th century. Now in this uh, talk, I'm gonna focus on China and especially what we could learn from Mansfield's uh, legacy for current US-China relations. And I'm gonna do this for a couple reasons. One is that's what President Karras and Dr. Reeb asked me to do. And, um, and I think for very good reason. Um, Mansfield did a lot in, in these areas. As I mentioned, he met with Nixon for several years. Uh, on uh, China-US relations and thinking about how to, uh, well, first convincing Nixon of the importance of, of this change in American policy and then thinking with him about a bipartisan way that that could be done. Then in 1972, Mansfield was one of the first Americans to go to China. He was not the first. The first was some kind of um, ping pong player who was invited out of the blue uh, by the Chinese government. Um, but Mansfield and the um, Senate Minority Leader were among the first Americans to go into China, and, and this is a picture of Mansfield being on the Great Wall of China in 1972. Uh, we don't know who these other uh, people are there with him, uh, but you can certainly see that would have been a very important moment in Mansfield's life. Here uh, we see a picture of um, Zhou Enlai, the Chinese premier for many years. He was the premier uh, basically sent from the Chinese revolution in 1949 until both he and Mao died in 1976. So Zhao Enlai was the, uh, the person in China who really implemented a lot of the policy that Mao uh, called for over the years. And he's known as someone who really moderated a lot of Mao's um, impulses uh, and he is today and has always been really regarded in in China as a very humane leader. Well uh, Mike Mansfield and Maureen Mansfield who always traveled with Mike uh, went to Beijing in 1974 and they met with Zhao Enlai uh, when he was sick he was actually in the hospital and he died um, a couple of years later and so you can see him here greeting Maureen and then here they're having a discussion. It looks like a nice small meeting, doesn't it? But you know, when you read it out, it turns out this was a much bigger room and there were a lot of people listening and taking notes. At the end of his trip, uh, Mansfield wrote, as he always did, a, a trip report, basically. And this one he sent to US President uh, Ford. And in the report, he uh, discussed his meeting with Zhao Enlai. And you can see some of the high points here. These are quotes. I met with a premier who appeared in good health for approximately 55 minutes, during which time he expressed deep respect for Nixon and his efforts to normalize relations with China. He also stated that the person really responsible for opening the door was Ch Chairman Mao. And um, then uh, Mansfield goes on and he says, Mansfield says, I assured him as the Democratic majority leader in the Senate that the policy which Nixon and Mao set in motion and President Ford was carrying forward was irreversible and said that even if a Democrat was elected president in 1976, that policy would continue. He said he looked forward to President Ford's visit in 1975 and would be delighted to confer with him. We had an affectionate and respectful parting. The last words he said to me were, the door between our two countries should never have been closed. Now in um, some of um, Mansfield's uh, verbatim readouts from these meetings, 
we learned that there is some discussion about whose fault it was that the door with China uh, and the U.S. was closed. And uh, Mansfield's position was that the U.S. really was living an anachronistic policy, that after the Chinese Revolution in 1949, the facts on the ground had changed, and our, our World War II ally, Chiang Kai-shek, was now, had retreated to Taiwan. He controlled very little territory. The, the Maoist government in China controlled all of mainland China. And you know, it, the realistic thing to do would have been at that point to have recognized the new Chinese government led by Mao. Uh, and that was, of course, the position of the Chinese interlocutors as well. Um, Mansfield was a U.S. diplomat. He did not uh, explicitly say, I absolutely agree with you. But in uh, report after report, speech after speech, we see him urging uh, for uh, the closure of this anachronistic policy and the opening of the door to China. Um, so, so it's interesting to see that the last uh, meeting that he had with Zhou Enlai um, and the last story of his um, trip comes down to this, essentially reminding us of the importance to keep uh, doors open in, in our conversation, to have our relations with other states reflect uh, the, the power distribution and the facts of the world. Well, so this leads me then to think about uh, what are the facts of the world right now, as Mike Mansfield might see them, and as I see them, in terms of the distribution of power in international relations. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this, um, about this change from unipolarity in 2014 to the emergence of Sino-US bipolarity in 2015. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the data that I see that makes me come to that conclusion. And then I'll finish up with some um, observations and speculations about what I think Mike Mansfield might have to say about this. Then we'll take some time to open up for questions. I'm always excited to hear your questions and your comments, so, so um, we'll have time for that as well. All right, well, from this you know, realist uh, perspective, looking at the distribution of capabilities among states, in the system, uh, we can date three recent periods in international relations history. Bipolarity between the US and Soviet Union from 1945 to 1989. US unipolarity after the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, and f even a little bit before that, I personally, I date uh, the end of US-Soviet bipolarity in 1989 because that was when the Soviet Union was no longer able to service its, its debts, its economic debts. And um, of course, the Soviet Union did not formally and officially um, fall apart, die, have a revolution, disintegrate into different states, and then you know, have the biggest part of it be renamed the Russian Russia until 1990, 1991. Um, but anyway, you know, people can quibble about the exact years, and of course they will. Uh, we all have different perspectives on these things. We think different things are important. But in general, um, there is agreement that the, U, the world internationally was unipolar beginning around 1990. And now there is a, quite a strong consensus that bipolarity has reemerged. There's, it's not a perfect consensus. Um, I was recently at the American Political Science Association meeting, and I went to panels with China experts and U.S. military experts, and I did a little poll. And by far the majority of scholars agreed that China has become a great power and that bipolarity has reemerged. But there are some questions among scholars about exactly when that happened, and, and there are some scholars who do not believe that it has happened yet. Uh, mostly those are scholars who focus on um, very precise uh, comparisons of military capabilities. So uh, for my purposes, I consider Sino-US bipolarity to have emerged in 2015. And so I'm going to say a little bit about that, first by talking about um, this definition of great power. So structural realism is the kind of realism that looks out at the structure of 
international politics, in other words, the distribution of great of capabilities. And it asks, um, you know, which states have the most capabilities? Those are the great powers. They're roughly equal in their capabilities, not exactly equal, but roughly equal. Equal enough that it would be hard to predict who would win in any kind of prolonged military or economic conflict. And here, the criteria are not just military and not just economic. There are instead an array of capabilities, uh, population, territory, resources, economic capability, military strength, a political stability, and competence. Now, what this means in different particular moments is going to vary, just as Mike Mansfield would have told us, right? Things change. And so this particular characteristics of a great power are going to change over time as well. What, what worked, in other words, for the US as a powerful state during unipolarity may not work anymore. We need to stay up with the times. Today, in um, the nuclear era, with global transportation and communication, um, I argue that a new great power would need to have a second strike force of nuclear weapons, global military reach of some sort, economic independence, and political competence to do this, you know, this matching of strategy to capabilities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these items. Um, first, though, I just want to say generally, as soon as a state achieves such capabilities, it is a great power, regardless of whether anybody formally says that it is, and regardless of whether it itself says that it is. And, but ideally, scholars would recognize this so that we can be accurate, and policymakers, we know from Mike Mansfield, should also recognize this as well, because sooner or later, these states are going to change their behavior. They're going to become more assertive in defending their existing interests, and they're more likely to become more expansive in defining their interests. So um, this is a two-slide comparison of China, first in 2005 and then in 2014-15. So in 2005, China did have its second strike force of nuclear weapons. And by that, I mean that China had the um, capability to deliver uh, nuclear weapons anywhere in the world and um, to uh, protect those weapons from a devastating strike that would have you know, taken them out before they could be used. So a first strike force is a, str is a force that um, you use to hit somebody first, and a second strike for for, uh, force you use to punish them if they hit you. Right? So deterrence rests on the ability to maintain a second strike force. Because if you have a second strike force, then anybody has to think very carefully about striking you first. Because they know that the chance of one devastating nuclear weapon getting through, could you know, eliminate a city, as we saw in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, cannot, cannot be you know, just wished away. So uh, China d has had this capability for some time. There are quite a few states in the international system that have a second strike force. We can number them on uh, one or two hands. So it isn't a huge number. There are 200 states at the UN. But um, somewhere around uh, a dozen states have nuclear capability. And in general, uh, most of those states, uh, we would say, have, have a, the ability to, to strike second. At that time, though, China did not have global military reach. It's only in the last couple of years that China has really expanded in this way, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, neither did China have economic independence that was sufficient to survive sanctions. And this is the thing that China got last. That, in, that is how my dating works. It triggers my dating in 2014. And then um, China has been a very competent state for a long time. We might quibble about, um, in fact, we could have some pretty strong debates, I would think, about whether programs like the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution reveal competence on the part of Chinese leaders. But those were domestic strategies. And internationally, China has been very good at matching its strategy, its posture to its capabilities, not overly threatening others and experiencing unintended consequences and um, not going beyond the reach of what they can support. By the end of 2014, 
China had all of these things. So let's just get into this a little bit more. So here you can see world military spending in 2014. The big blue circle is the United States. These show the top 15 defense budgets in US dollars. So in um, 2014, China was the number two spender in US dollars, fol uh, followed by Saudi Arabia and Russia. Now, obviously, spending is not everything you need to know, and especially spending in US dollars is probably not that significant from the point of view of China, because China's got a big domestic economy. It can build a lot of things without actually having to use US dollars. So what is more significant from the point of view of China is its actual capabilities, not so much its spending. And um, by the time 2014 came around, China not only had a second strike force, but it had modernized its ICBMs to where um, they were more reliable, more threatening. Uh, in other words, we were more certain that the US could strike cities like Washington, DC, uh, um, you know, Washington, Seattle, and so on. Um, also, China had some new and more sophisticated long and intermediate range missiles that uh, could target US aircraft carriers and US territories in the Western Pacific, such as the US territory of Guam, where the US has very large naval bases. Given that the US's uh, power projection posture is so reliant on US aircraft carriers, this is a very uh, significant capability for China. Because what it means is that um, if the US and China were to get into a military conflict, China would not necessarily need to move any troops or uh, you know, use any ships to uh, engage in that conflict. It could simply, from its own home territory, launch long and intermediate range missiles that would destroy US capabilities. And um, we know from um, basically some war gaming that the US does, uh, US military and intelligence services do, and also US think tanks like RAND, that um, it really is very difficult to um, imagine any longer that um, US aircraft carriers would be safe in that kind of a conflict. Obviously, China would, would know that it would be vulnerable to retaliation, which is a good reason that it hasn't done this yet. But in any case where the US is perceived as infringing on Chinese interests in a serious and significant way that China is not able to address with diplomacy and other measures, it is very possible for the China, Chinese government to destroy a significant amount of American military capability. And this means that a war between the US and China would be very difficult to predict the outcome of that war. Um, the US, the China also has a lot more aircraft, as I've mentioned here. They can be based in various places and are increasingly based in uh, more places. Um, this week, the Solomon Islands decided to revoke its recognition of Taiwan and to recognize China, uh, the mainland China government, as instead. And um, this is thought to be um, the precursor to China basing more of its military capabilities in the Western Pacific instead of on its, uh, so much on its own home territory. Um, in terms of global reach, the Chinese uh, have military capabilities and um, you know, civilian capabilities that could be turned into military capabilities rather quickly uh, all over the world. There's uh, these string of bases in the Indian Ocean. There are warships uh, in, uh, around um, uh, Somalia that are uh, you know, there to help in an international effort to avert piracy. Um, they frequently exercise their military forces all over the world, alone and with Russia. And they have workers, advisors, scientists, peacekeepers on, on every continent. So military capability, I hope you can see, is really uh, quite closely matched between the two in terms of any kind of 
of um, strategic consideration. Now, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot, there are some Americans who are specialists in, in military technology who want to delve more deeply into, well, exactly how will this system match up with this system, and aren't we more sophisticated technologically, and so on. And I think those are important considerations. Obviously, if we're going to get into a war and need to plan in case we get into a war with China, those are extremely important considerations. But for the point, from the purpose, for the purpose of deciding if China is a great power and if that means that we should expect it to act differently, whether that means we need to think differently about how we treat it, I would say that this level of military parity is, is sufficient. It surpasses the uh, level of parity um, that we saw uh, during the Cold War, um, especially economically. So let's, let's move on to there. So world GDP in 2015, according to the IMF, you can measure this in two different ways. You can measure it, as you can see on the left, in terms of, um, of uh, US dollars. Or you can measure it on the right in terms of the local currency. So in 2014, China surpassed the US in terms of the size of the economy measured in GDP in purchasing power parity. In other words, uh, based on local Chinese currency, if uh, you add up the value of all of the goods and services that are produced in China that year, and you compare it to all the goods and services denominated in dollars produced in the US, the Chinese economy was larger than the US economy. Only in terms of GDP measured in dollars is the US still ahead. And obviously, that is most relevant for the US for dollars. It would only be highly relevant to China if China had to use dollars in order to engage in any sort of domestic and international commerce. And of course, that's not the case. So when you think about the base of power for states, economy is obviously very important. You can't sustain a state-of-the-art military if you don't have an up-to-date economy. That was, of course, something we all learned from the Soviet Union. So its economic capabilities are extremely important. Um, its external trade now is less than half of its GDP. In other words, it's becoming more, mostly self-reliant and more and more self-reliant. It has more trading partners. It's the number one trading partner of more countries in the world than the United States. Um, it is about equally vulnerable, or at least until President Trump started putting tariffs on Chinese exports, it was about equally uh, vulnerable to the EU, US and EU. Since 2018, when President Trump started to put tariffs on Chinese imports, China has moved down from Ch the US's number one trading partner to number three. And of course, that just gives China more autonomy, more self-reliance. It isn't so vulnerable to US sanctions. Uh, it has tri you know, trillions of dollars of uh, foreign exchange reserves, huge, uh, in other words, co in contrast to the US, which has a debt, China has an enormous surplus that it can use to invest in things or to use in, in emergency situations. Uh, it has diverse international interests um, all over the world and all sorts of different interests. Often it's, we hear about how China is a major holder of US treasuries, in other words, US debt. Um, but China is only the number two holder internationally after Japan, and most US debt is actually held by American uh, individuals and American uh, agencies like the, the Treasury Department itself. So China does not hold the majority of debt. It only holds the second highest amount of American debt held by any outside country. Now, the reason that I date this change from unipolarity to bipolarity to 2014 is because of these currency swap agreements that China entered into in, uh, after 2008, culminating with one with our largest trading partner, Canada, in 2014. So by 2014, uh, Canada, I'm sorry, China had agreements with 20 major economies in the world, including Canada and the EU, our biggest trading partners, and Mexico, to um, use each other's local currencies instead of the dollar if there was ever an international financial crisis. 
So this is a very, very significant development because for years, you know, the dollar has been the international currency. It still is, you know, the major currency that's used. But in 2008, when we had the housing crisis in the U.S. that set off the international banking crisis, um, this new um, financial instrument, currency swaps, were uh, perfected and innovated. And basically, they are what enabled the U.S and other countries to continue to sort of lubricate the international economy in the middle of this crisis. They created a lot more liquidity and confidence during this crisis. So China um, you know, observed how these worked, first began to implement currency swap agreements with countries that the US was sanctioning, like uh, Russia, Argentina, and so on, with whom China was trading and wanted to continue to trade. And then it implemented these with countries that it was, uh, you know, it knew that it trades with a lot, that it was concerned that the US might not enable China to use the currency or might sanction the countries if they, um, if they traded with China. So this was a significant development because it showed, um, in a sense, it was sort of like a public vote for China's great power status. For a major trading partner like Canada, to enter into an agreement like this that was published was a, an indication to the United States that China really was a powerful country economically. It was, it's interacting with it was giving countries a lot of benefits and countries even our good friends were planning to continue that. Now, um, China, sometimes China, uh, sometimes people talk about how even if China's a great power now, it's not going to stay a great power for long because it's not a democracy and uh, it's not a capitalist state and so on. But I think it's really important to recognize that people have been saying that about China since 1949. And, uh, you know, so far, so good. China has. Um, really been competent in terms of raising the standard of living of its people, of working with people and countries in other parts of the world to raise their standards of living. Of, um, I mean, the, the 2008 financial crisis was resolved without a larger depression because of Chinese liquidity and Chinese responsible behavior in maintaining its own and increasing its own trade with us and our allies. Um, so I think it's, it's important to give credit where it's due. Now, it, of course, there's no reason to think that states have to remain great powers forever. Most of us can probably remember when the Soviet Union fell apart. Um, but this just reminds us of Mike Mansfield's principle that you have to keep updating. All right, so um, at this point, I'm just gonna let uh, Gerda know that it's fine to hand around some comment cards or to start collecting some comment cards because we're down, we're down to just a little bit more of my talk. So based on the rise of great powers and then the rise of China as a great power since January 2015, we would expect that there would be different behaviors in international politics, and in particular, that U.S.-China relations would have changed significantly in some ways. And I'm not going to go into the details of this right now. I'm happy to talk about any questions you have or evidence for or against this idea. But, you know, the theory basically says after the distribution of power changes from unipolarity to bipolarity, we should begin to see China being more confident, more assertive. We should begin to see the U.S. trying to balance Chinese power, being more attuned to China, even emulating some successful Chinese policies, and becoming socialized to the system. In other words, um, realizing that the U.S. is not the only game in town anymore. Not that, of course, it ever was the only game in town, right? Unipolarity, first among equals. The, U the U.S. was a very powerful state. It did not have a peer competitor for quite a long time. Um, it got us thinking we could do a lot of stuff. And we would expect that as we now know that China has become a great power, we would think twice about some of the things that we were do doing since the end of the Cold War. Uh, we would expect both the U.S. and China to be able to withstand economic sanctions on one another. And two, we would expect them to begin to apply those sanctions to each other. Now, when I first started talking about this around 2014, I never would have expected that we would get to the point so quickly that we are right now with President Trump's sanctions 
on um, increasing numbers of Chinese goods. His, he now has on the table uh, a plan to sanction every good or to, tr to tax, put a tariff on, every good from China imported into the US. China uh, has retaliated, but China has only retaliated on a, a small percentage of American goods. Um, so China has been actually quite restrained in its response, and the US has worked much qu more quickly than I would have ever expected. Nevertheless, it is interesting to notice that we are in a world with economic sanctions and tariffs and efforts to delink these economies that were quite linked together uh, before China became a great power. Based on the presence of nuclear weapons, we would expect that uh, both the US and China would be restrained in their interactions with one another and with other nuclear powers. In other words, we would expect a containment in that old Cold War um, uh, parlance. And we would expect that they would recognize that they have some interests in common. In economics, we talk about monopolies, which would be you know, an equivalent to unipolarity, and, and duopolies, which is the sort of market equivalent to bipolarity. In a duopoly, econ e uh, economists expect the two leading companies to cooperate with each other to some extent. They not only have conflicts, they have cross-cutting interests. And one of their primary cross-cutting interests is to not let anybody else get any of their market share. Right? And so a sensible duopolist you know, recognizes that they are allies in some fashion with their competitor at the same time that they need to be alert to the, you know, essentially the security threat of that. So, the, so it's an interesting situation of both conflict and cooperation. And we would expect this kind of, um, this kind of behavior to pertain especially to shared threats like terrorism, uh, nuclear proliferation, climate change, and the rise of new great powers. Well, let's go back to Mike Mansfield and think about what he might say to us now um, that China has become a great power. Now, first of all, I want to say, I, who knows what Mike Mansfield would say. First of all, you know, it was a long time ago that he was in a situation like this and the technology of the time was quite different. Um, second of all, you know, like any good politician and scholar, he wasn't super specific. In fact, he argued, you know, no one policy is always going to work. But from a 1956 speech that he gave in the Senate on U.S.-Soviet relations, I think that we can see his principles and how he would apply them. Now, the reason that we want to look at the Soviet uh, speech and not the Chinese, China speeches that he gave is that in 1956, we were in US-Soviet bipolarity. And so all the stuff that Mansfield did about China has to be understood in the context, the larger context of US-Soviet competition. And the you know, changing, China changing sides from the Soviet side to the US side was seen as a big uh, change in the Cold War. And of course, in bipolarity, it doesn't really make that much difference because China wasn't the third great power. It was just the largest, uh, one of the larger, more significant middle powers. Anyway, to understand what Mansfield might say about China today, we need to think about what he said about the Soviet Union during bipolarity. So I found this speech he gave in 1956, and um, he talks first and foremost about how uncertain the situation is. And he emphasizes how in 1956, you know, we really didn't know that much about what was happening in the Soviet Union. Unlike the situation that we have today with China, we do not, there were no Americans to speak of in the Soviet Union. It was illegal for American companies and individuals to trade with the Soviet Union, and had been for some time. Uh, it, uh, only in the rarest circumstance in the 1950s and 1960s were Americans allowed into the Soviet Union legally and vice versa into the United States. So we really did not know very much about each other. And I think that is a real reason for, um, you know, some optimism with regard to China. We know a lot more about each other. We continue to have relations with one another today. One of the sources of big of risk that that Mansfield was most concerned about um, was this this sh total uncertainty. And you know, sure, there's always going to be some risk with another great power, but that has been reduced to some extent. He talked about the need to help ourselves to think about 
what the Soviets might do to assess their rhetoric, to recognize the possibility that they would expand into Europe and Asia. Um, but he also said, you know, we should consider other threats as well. We should not be myopic about the Soviet Union. In fact, what was the thing that he said we should pay attention to? He said, we should think about, um, well, first of all, inadvertently making U.S.-Soviet relations worse, but also uh, not paying attention to the legitimate desires of people in poor countries and other countries to have a better standard of living, to have more autonomy over their own lives, to have more control over their own governments. So he was concerned about the risk of nationalism. He was also concerned about any sort of extreme policy in the United States that might risk the uh, losing support of the American people. Uh, he was affected by the McCarthy investigations in the Senate, and um, he, he really feared the polarization based on ideology that that represented. So he talks about bipartisanship as an important thing, and of course that is why he worked with Nixon during the Cold War, even though Nixon was a Republican. Um, I think, you know, in addition to calling for bipartisanship today, Mansfield would probably predict that we would see more bipartisanship today. Because after all, today Americans are in a different situation than we've been for the last uh, 30 years while, the, um, while we haven't had any external threats, any significant external threats to worry about. Uh, realists in general, and I think Mansfield in particular, would predict that it's going to be easier to, to have a bipartisan foreign policy and other bipartisan initiatives in the U.S. as a result of this more intense international competition. Finally, at the end of the speech about U.S.-Soviet relations, Mansfield talked about the importance of not just being negative or defensive in our foreign policy, but also being positive and proactive. He talked about the, the, his belief that people all over the world want to have a good life, and that if the U.S. talks about the importance of people, both our own people and other people in our foreign policy, will be seen as more legitimate, others will build up their capabilities, they will be safer, will be safer, and we'll have more, um, more allies that we can cooperate with if we should get into some security problems. All right, well, I'm going to leave it there. I'm looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much.